it's healing up. Um, this is uh, the Prussian series. Uh, this is the Battle of that place, 1757. Video. The enemy holds the same entrenched camp of Breslau which my troops defended so honorably. I am marching to attack this position. The decisive moment is approaching. Contrary to every rule of art, I shall attack the army under the command of Prince Charles, even though it be three times my own strength wherever and whenever I may meet it. The number of the foe, the strength of their position, are here matters of but secondary importance. All these must yield, I feel confident before the unflinching bravery of my troops and the judicious execution of my orders. I must venture on this step, or all is lost. I fully recognize the dangers attached to this enterprise, but in my present situation I must conquer or die. If we go under, all is lost. I love this 1906 painting by Hugo Ungewitter. It displays Frederick the Great and his generals at Born preceding the iconic Battle of Leuten. If you love art and history, it may be a stretch to ever own a work such as that, unless you happen to be as rich as Frederick the Great. That brings me to today's video sponsor. How rich was Frederick, Frederick the Great? Masterworks, the leading platform for investing in blue chip art. Masterworks allows anyone to invest in art by world renowned artists like Picasso, Banksy, Monet, and. In late November, dispatches reached Frederick of the Duke of Bavern's retreat after the battle. If you've ever stuck your toe in a gym, then you've probably seen people drinking whey protein. Whey has become so popular that it's actually expected to become an 18. Bavern's retreat after the Battle of Breslau. Frederick was livid, and he ordered Bavern to relieve the city or to face capital punishment. Within three days, the remaining garrison surrendered Breslau, and Frederick learned the Austrians captured Bavern. All major Silesian strongholds, his exquisite defense against any invasion from the south, were in Austrian hands. Describing the situation as serious is an understatement. His army camped at Parchwitz for a week until December 4th. It became the central hub Meanwhile, in the Austrian camp, Prince Charles learned of Frederick's position at Parchwitz. He figured, heavily outnumbering the Prussian king, this was the time to strike. Disregarding advice for caution, he wanted to strike at Frederick fast to prevent him from fortifying his position. He sent the army's bake ovens and a small corps ahead. Esprey writes that Charles did not even consider the possibility of Frederick attacking him. On December 2nd, Zieten's column of demoralized soldiers arrived at Parchwitz. The Prussian army numbered some 33,000, many of them battered, worn down and tired. Of course, the army's morale was strengthened by the soldiers' tills who fought at Rosbach, and Frederick's attitude towards his men certainly played a vital part. Frederick was never more close to his army than at Parchwitz. During these winter days, the king camped in the open air like one of his private soldiers. He used to warm himself at their fires and then make room for the others to take his place. He talked with the soldiers as if they were of his own kind. He sympathized with the travails which they had undergone and in the most friendly possible way, he encouraged them to behave like heroes just once more. The constant desertions of forcibly enlisted Saxons and other uncommitted soldiers left Frederick with a loyal, battle-hardened force. On December 3rd, Frederick himself approaching exhaustion, prepared for the assault against the Austrians. He promised his drained men wealth and promotion. He expected the Austrians to barricade themselves around Breslau, utilizing its strong natural fortifications. In the early morning of December 4th, the Prussian army departed. 
Skirmishes with Austrian hussars revealed the Austrian army was close, but nowhere to be seen. It wasn't until that evening Frederick learned the Austrians abandoned this stronghold around Breslau and they were within a day's marching distance. Frederick couldn't believe his luck. The plane they held was the same plane the Prussian army conducted its autumn war games. They knew it through and through. <laughs> that night, nice. the Prussians camped weapon in hand without fire. It was freezing. In the distance, they saw the enemy's campfires. Frederick fielded around 12,000 cavalry and 128 squadrons, slightly under 23,000 infantry, and 160 artillery guns. At 4 a.m., the army awoke in silence and began their march in two infantry columns, flanked by cavalry on either side. Frederick rode among the vanguard with hussars and light Jaeger infantry. When the morning mist faded, a wide, open plain covered with light snow appeared. Frederick could likely name every village in the region, allowing him to give his subordinates clear instructions for deployment. Frederick reached the village of Born, where the Prussian cavalry engaged in a slight skirmish against Austrian and Saxon hussars. These were quickly routed and 600 prisoners were taken. Three wow. infantry battalions held Born while Frederick climbed the Schönberg. Here, he saw the Austrian deployment, a vast line from north to south, spanning some eight kilometers, faced him. The Austrians had just finished deploying. Earlier that morning, the Austrians were marching when news of Frederick's advance reached them. It caught them by surprise. Two lines extended from Nippern to the south of Leuten. To the left rear, Nadashti manned the reserves. The Austrian army was significantly larger than Frederick expected. Prince Charles commanded between 65 and 70,000 troops. 5,000 of them were irregulars. The so they pretty much have, he, I think he had, it looked like 35,000. So they've almost doubled it. Prussian vanguards marched towards Born led Charles to believe the Prussians would attack his right flank. This flank was protected by the Zettelbusch, the only extensively wooded area of the plain. Meanwhile, the Austrian left did not enjoy many natural defenses. In addition, the Sofienberg provided a perfect cover for his army to maneuver itself to the Austrian south unnoticed. For his plan to work, the Austrians had to be convinced he was attacking their well-defended right flank. He deployed one infantry and one cavalry unit in full view of the Austrians on the right. Charles saw these maneuvers and called nine infantry battalions from the south to augment his right flank between Nippern and Fröbelwitz. This was over an hour of hard marching away from the southern tip at Sackschutz. As the Austrian infantry moved from the south to the north, the exact opposite happened behind the hill. It was past noon when the first Prussian columns reached Lobetins, removed from the Austrians' view. The columns swerved to their left, approaching the Austrian flank. Zieten rode far in advance towards the final line of march near the Schweidnitzer River. With the Prussian columns moving into their positions, Frederick rode towards Radaxdorf, to observe the enemy. Prince Charles noticed the Prussian maneuver, but initially figured it was a diversion. He ordered the second line of infantry to break up and move to the south to augment the southernmost lines. These were held by German auxiliaries. The mobile Prussian artillery positioned itself on the Glansberg. Around this time, Moritz of Analdessa warned Frederick that in midwinter the days were very short and it was already past noon. Frederick agreed, and he gave the order to attack. He warned all his regiments to advance slowly, leading to a textbook oblique order formation, with his right flank engaging in battle first. The German auxiliaries at Sackschutz received the brunt of the damage, putting up surprisingly fierce resistance. They realized they were outnumbered, and many on the left flank broke. Nadashdi countered Zitin's charge, and fierce combat broke out to the south of Golau. Meanwhile, the Prussian artillery opened fire, tearing into the Austrian lines. 
Zetan's cavalry proved to be too strong and Nadashti's cavalry broke. Charles realized he would not be able to remedy the southern flank with his reserves, so he ordered his entire army to bend to the south. The Austrians formed up in a line through Leuten. Meanwhile, the mobile Prussian artillery deployed on the Butterberg and Judenberg, opening a devastating volley of fire against the Austrian lines. It was 3.30 p.m. when the second phase of the battle commenced. The Prussians launched a renewed assault against the newly formed Austrian line. The fiercest combat concentrated inside Leuten, where savage door-to-door -door fighting broke out. Some Prussian battalions were beaten back, but the Prussian artillery compensated by opening a deafening barrage against the village. After half an hour of fighting, the Prussians seized a burning Leuten. However, strong resistance behind the village continued. Then, the Austrian cavalry swerved down from the Austrian right. If successful, they could have easily turned the tide of the battle and crushed the Prussians from their left. But stationed nearby Radaxdorf, Lieutenant General Georg Wilhelm von Driessen commanded the reserve cavalry. Uncommitted and noticing the Austrian charge, he launched a countercharge. His cavalry clashed with the Austrian right. Heavy combat broke out as the Austrians attempted to find their footing. When it appeared the fighting would shift in the Austrian balance, the additional Prussian cavalry reserves came to Driessen's aid. The Austrian cavalry crumbled before the Prussian cavalry charged into the Austrian infantry lines north of Leuten. Entire battalions threw their weapons away and fled or surrendered. Any soldier who attempted to make a stand was overrun by his comrades fleeing for their lives. The entire Austrian army collapsed into a rout. Riesen's cavalry provided the nail in the Austrian army's coffin. Against the odds, Prussia emerged victoriously. Darkness soon set in and the surviving Austrians fled towards the Bohemian hills. In total, the Prussia suffered 6,382 casualties, about 1,200 dead and the remainder wounded. The Austrians lost 22,000 men, over 12,000 were captured, over 3,000 dead, and 6 to 7,000 wounded. 17 generals were among the dead and wounded, and 116 pieces of artillery and 51 standards were seized. They lost up to a third of their effective army fielded against Frederick, an enormously high percentage. The Groove Wallet's so cool, it'll get you out of some tough situations. I don't care. Are you aware you're illegally parked? Pull your gun and oh. shoot him. Shoot no, him. I'm, I'm... Shoot him. Shoot him. Okay. Not just contemporary observers and later historians refer to the Battle of Leuten as Frederick the Great's finest moment. Even Napoleon acknowledged its genius. Just like at Rosbach, everything went right for Frederick. The knowledge of the battlefield, the extended enemy lines and the cooperation of Prussian commanders like a well-oiled machine. All thanks to those autumn war game trainings. The artillery, infantry and cavalry work together perfectly, with subordinates taking initiative whenever the opportunity presented itself. It ended up leading to victory. Frederick did not launch a pursuit until two days after the battle, leading to most Austrian soldiers escaping across the border. Some sources indicate these didn't escape, but rather were pushed by Frederick's belated pursuit. The implications of Rosbach were enormously favorable regarding the French. The implications of Leuten made an astronomical difference. Frederick faced down and beat a high morale, well equipped and recently victorious army. If the Austrians had beaten him, the Kingdom of Prussia would have been no more. There was no alternative to victory. After the defeat, the Austrians retreated into Bohemia. They still held Schweidnitz and Breslau. Frederick subjected Breslau to a severe bombardment and within two weeks the entire garrison surrendered. Still, you can imagine the atmosphere in Vienna. 
Every phase is marked by anguish and panic, and the general dismay is much more intense than it was back in May following the defeat at Prague. The end of the 1757 campaign cemented Frederick's reputation as a great military commander. But Frederick himself wasn't in a triumphalist mood. He told his subordinates, Leuten had been a sticker plaster on his wounds, it had not healed everything. He saved the relief of Schweidnitz for the next year's campaigning. His army took up winter quarters. The campaign of 1757, an incredibly prolonged campaign, came to an end. Prussia fought an unusual number of battles, yet an epidemic hitting the winter quarters killed more soldiers than all those battles combined. Still, the campaign was extraordinary. Would they have like smallpox or something hit? Nary with a surprising number of reverses and twists. Frederick himself referred to it as a campaign that was like three in one. But the war was far from over, and the next year would bring renewed warfare, reverses, and twists. Thank you so much. This is pretty much, yeah, this is, I mean, it's not the start, but this is like the, be the beginning years. Year? Year? Years? Of uh, the, the Seven Years' War. Uh, in America, it's known as the French and Indian War. But yeah, the Seven Years' War. That was good. I, I just. There's always. There's something about him that I just feel like he's going to lose, but I know he's not going to. <laughs> he's, he's a very. He's good. He's got a good mind, a brilliant mind for for what he does. And you can see the difference with his his other leaders and him. Um, but, you know. Well, I'm going to end this here. Like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Um, you know. Uh, if you run into, like, a child in the park, uh, keep their toes I don't know just hacksaw them off and put them in your pocket I think it's good luck it's like a rabbit's foot